And there's, there's many different ways that someone can make things better in the NHS, um, from very formal project and program management through to running um, far more small scale localized projects to, to improve things. And the aims of today's session really is to equip you with those basic skills to, to run local projects, um, to take ownership of issues in, uh, in your local area and, and fix them quite rapidly. But then also to give you a framework that you can use to tackle bigger problems um, and scale up and share innovations and improvements across your organization or, or across different parts of the NHS. Um, first gonna start by discussing the main principles of quality improvement, going to talk about the model for improvement, which is a simple and uh, effective framework for, for running quality improvement projects. And I'm gonna run through the plan, do, study, act cycle, which is an effective way of testing uh, improvement ideas, refining them and uh, spreading them to, to a, a wider area. Um, if we have time at the end of that, usually that all those, those things would be a whole morning session. So we'll, we'll see how we do with 40 minutes. But if we get through all of that, I'm gonna discuss a number of factors that from my experience make a huge amount of difference to whether improvement initiatives succeed, fail, or you know, just get the best results they possibly can. So as a first question, what, what is quality in this context? Um, the Institute of Medicine defines quality uh, in terms of uh, the aspects that care should, should have. Uh, care should be safe, effective, person-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. And any steps we take to, to improve these factors could be considered quality improvement. Quality assurance is often confused with, uh, with quality improvement. Quality assurance is far more about making sure that we're meeting minimum standards and external targets. Um, this is the business of performance reporting, targets, audit, inspections. It is, it is important to make sure that we're getting the basics right, but it, it generally only gets us to a basic level. It doesn't, doesn't promote continuous improvement. And um, it's generally not very engaging for people. It's uh, just about doing the bare minimum. Innovation is another, another area that often gets wrapped up with quality improvement. And this is, this is often where we're talking about taking a, a, a step change in the way that we do things. Um, you know, harnessing new technologies, R&D, taking very, very different processes and making like a very wide scale change all at once. And um, sometimes this is absolutely necessary. I mean, we've seen over the course of this year that a lot of our existing processes have, have just had to change very dramatically, very quickly, whether it's the move to home working or rapidly changing the, the configurations and processes in the hospitals. Um, we have had to be innovative. But innovation is, is expensive, um, it's risky, and it's, it's hard to test big changes um, without really stopping the day-to-day -day work that we're doing, which is often impossible in a, in a hospital setting. Quality improvement is, is far more about continuously improving. Um, it's about trying to make lasting change. It's very much about using data, wisdom and shared knowledge to uh, identify things that can be refined and improved and to test and uh, make changes iteratively. It's quite an agile um, methodology. And um, the methods of it are what we're going to discuss today. Potential drawbacks of QI are that it's not always a quick fix. You, you do need um, 
a certain amount of commitment of time, energy, and uh, you do need access to data. Um, can be a challenge if, if you have very short time spans or you, you have limited information about what's happened in the past because you, you do need to collect data to understand your current position before improving it in QI. So what does it take to make change happen? You're gonna need the will to do what it takes to make a change. And uh, this, this is the first, one of the first things I mentioned because there, there's a lot of resistance to change, um, especially in hospitals. You, you have people with very different priorities, more targets than it's possible to actually achieve on a, on a regular basis. And um, there's, there's a, a hell of a lot of change fatigue in, in the healthcare sector, whether it's from changes that have come through from, from government and policy changes, or the, the often changing uh, faces of operational managers you might be dealing with. Um, being an improver, often you need a thick skin and you, you do need to, to really believe in what you're doing. Second thing you're gonna need is ideas. Um, often there are not a lot of quick fixes and it's gonna take a lot of different solutions to, to make lasting change. And lastly, you're gonna need the, the skills and knowledge and um, a methodology to allow you to execute your ideas and uh, drive lasting change. So we often in QI talk about two types of change. The first represented by this picture is first order change. You're, you're sort of firefighting and reacting to things as they happen. This is very much about keeping things running, solving or reacting to problems or, or, or trying to get back to a, a state of equilibrium. This might be, for example, um, growing waiting lists you know, a first order change to your processes might be to put on a number of weekend clinics or start overbooking clinics, putting in extra slots here and there to see more patients and drive the waiting list length and average weight down. Um, can be very effective. We, we do a lot of this every day, managing crises, but it doesn't deal with the root cause and it doesn't necessarily prevent those problems happening again. To prevent those problems happening again, we need to address and make second order changes. This is where we actually redesign the system and try and mitigate some of those risks from happening again. We might uh, create new processes or, or try and remove processes entirely to uh, make lasting change and uh, prevent a lot of that firefighting. This generally takes a bit more effort but saves time in the long run. One very effective model for running QI projects is the model for improvement. Uh, this is a very simple model that's, that's been around since the early 2000s, uh, created by the uh, Association of, uh, I forget, the API. Um, but it's been adopted by the Institute of Health Improvement and heavily recommended by NHS Improvement as well. Um, it's a tried and tested model, which is incredibly effective for how simple it is. It covers these three core elements when, when trying to set up a project. You ask yourself these questions of what are you trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? Basically gives you a framework for developing, testing and implementing changes. Um, reduces risk by starting very small and uses plan, do, study, act cycles to iteratively test and scale up uh, potential improvements that you're going to uh, adopt in your workplace. Addressing the first of these questions, 
uh, what are we trying to accomplish is about setting an aim. Now, before actually addressing a problem, setting a name is very important. Um, it states the overall why of the piece of work that you're doing. Um, helps you identify and articulate your, your goals and makes it very easy for you to describe to other people that you might need to engage in the project, what you're setting out to achieve um, and getting them on board without risking the project becoming something that you don't intend it to be. Um, from my experience, a huge amount of projects start out with an aim that's in somebody's head, but as soon as you start bringing in other, other stakeholders, other people you might need to achieve that goal, the, the scope of those projects can creep and grow and morph. And what starts out as, as a project perhaps to address patient experience can become developing a poster for, for a staff room or you know, absolutely morph into something completely different from what's intended. Having an aim statement up front that very clearly says what you're setting out to do can, can prevent a lot of that. It can also uh, help you develop accountability. Um, if you have a set deadline or a set uh, specific target that you're trying to meet. Um, it can be very clear whether a project has succeeded or failed or, you know, is, is it achieved the, the intended benefits that it's supposed to. Um, again, a lot of very vague projects start out with just, we want to improve something, we want to make it better. And that could be a 1% improvement or a 5,000% improvement. Um, if, if you're going to commit a certain amount of time and resource to improving something, it has to be worthwhile. We, we only have so much limited time and resource to, to put towards things. We, from the very beginning, should know that what we're aiming for is a worthy target. So the, the best standard for, for creating aim statements is, is to make a smart, um, a smart aim statement. I'm sure most of you will have heard of SMART before, but to just run through it in terms of QI, this is about creating a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound statement. The very important ones, I think, in this are specificity the, and being measurable. Um, achievable, relevant, and time-bound are, are important. Um, it is, it is important to not set out to do something that can't be achieved, um, isn't, isn't a huge priority. And having some sort of deadline to focus you is important, but we have to be realistic that in the NHS, especially at the moment, things do not always move at the, the time scales that we, we want them to. So having, having a, a deadline to focus you to and help you map out the actions you need to take is very important but it should always have some built-in tolerances to, to allow you to actually achieve something in the time that you may have available for this. The other two though are, are core. Um, you need to be very specific about what it is that you're, you're trying to achieve from the beginning. And um, quality improvement, especially in the model for improvement, is, is a very data-driven methodology and uh, if you can't measure things, this probably isn't the, the best, best framework for you to be using. You need to be able to collect and assess data, um, often on a number of different things. So choosing an objective that you can measure performance again is very important. I'll give you a few examples of some aims I've seen in the past. Um, none of these would be considered a smart aim. All of them are lacking something, um, but some very, very intelligent people have put these together for, for projects. These, these have all been presented in the past um, with slight date changes, of course. Um, yes, the first one, uh, reducing dermatology DNAs. Again, would a 0.1% would a reduction over a year, would that be a successful project? Potentially not. Um, certainly not worth spending any, any reasonable amount of time on. Um, 
increasing patient throughput for hemoc surgical day cases. Again, by, by how much are we trying to do this? Is, is this for any particular um, subspecialty or, or is any, any type of activity um, going to be acceptable for this? Um, introducing an electronic monitoring system to monitor activity was, was one I've seen in the past that had gone through several boards. Um, no one knew quite what the activity was that was going to be recorded or, or what the system was, was going to, to look like at all. This was very much someone who wanted to develop an app. So it created an, a, an aim that basically was describing the solution that you wanted to uh, create wasn't actually talking about the problem that he was looking to address and certainly not, not one that you could measure against it, you know, it's pass fail. Um, and the last one, you know, not being able to, uh, you know, what, what is clinically necessary? Um, you know, it's, it's a grand aim, but it's, it's an aspiration more than a, a smart objective. Um, doesn't give anything that you can measure against in any, any meaningful way. This brings us to measurement. Um, and measurement is key in quality improvement. As the second element um, of the model for improvement states, how will we know that a change is an improvement? And we, we do this through measurement. Firstly, we need to understand actually what, what is our current state? Um, what is our baseline for performance at the moment? A, a lot of projects start on quite anecdotal grounds. They, um, people feel there's a problem. They, they may have some inkling of what it might be and they make decisions to address it without actually knowing um, yeah, what, where they're starting from and where they're, they're going to end up afterwards. If, if you're going to address any complex system, you're likely to need multiple interventions to, to generate a, a meaningful improvement. And you're, you're going to want to be able to test each of those. You're going to want to see um, if, if you make several changes all at the same time, you may have some that have positive effects and some that have negative ones. Um, it may look like there's no overall change from doing that, but having a well planned out measurement plan with a number of different measures will allow you to uh, see the effectiveness of all the different initiatives that you might be taking. And the other reasons are around evidence and engagement. Um, most projects that you're starting at a small scale, if, if they work, could have benefit elsewhere. It's, it's a huge, huge shame that in the NHS, often within one organization, you might have half a dozen teams working on the same problem, doing the same initiatives um, and just duplicating effort. If, if you're able to capture data, show effectiveness or, or almost as importantly, show things that are ineffective, you can save a huge amount of information, you can share learning um, and you can save, save your colleagues and other specialties a huge amount of work. Um, the other thing also is if, if you've got something effective that you want to scale up, potentially take uh, across your organization or, or nationally, you're, you're going to need to engage other people. You're going to need to be able to prove to them um, the, that your uh, initiatives are well thought through, that they've, they've tested a number of different ways of achieving your goal. And um, it will help you produce the materials you need to engage others to champion your work and share it across other systems. The first core measure that is important in any QI project is, is, is an outcome measure directly linked to your aim statement. Um, this, this is going to be your overall metric that you want to see a positive move in. Um, for example, if you were trying to reduce DNA rates, you would have your DNA rate as this. This should be your, your headline figure for your project. Supporting this, you'll have process measures. These, might, these are 
not necessarily individually going to affect your outcome measure, but you have these all the different elements in, in your related process to see, see how your system is performing and to see what effects your interventions might be having on the wider system. Uh, using the example of DNA rates, again, you might um, put measures on how many reminders have been sent out, how many phone calls have been made to confirm appointments, um, whether you have uh, all the phone numbers and addresses checked for your patients um, in, in the recent past so that they're likely to get their reminder letters and, and messages. Balancing measures, um, again, these are used to measure things in the wider system to make sure that what you're doing isn't gonna have a knock-on negative effect on the wider system around you. Um, for example, it might be great to reduce and remove all the DNAs in a, in a trust, um, but if every patient actually turned up, uh, would this then put more pressure on imaging or phlebotomy or other services that <clears throat> are used to a, a lower footfall because a certain proportion of patients don't turn up? Do we need to ensure that waiting times have not increased in those sections, that they're sufficiently staffed and that patient experience hasn't dropped in those areas? Those would be balancing measures. And the last one that's usually, usually key in most projects is having some financial measures. Um, certainly if, if you want to spread something across an organization and you want to get managerial buy-in, proving that something has some financial benefit will, will nearly always be a, a benefit to you. And it's something that sometimes can be um, very accurately uh, calculated, but Often it might be looking at you know, average cost for a procedure or of, of an appointment and trying to calculate, you know, have, have we saved, saved work or have we generated extra activity through our, our measures? Um, have we used less equipment? Have we turned around things more, more smoothly so that we can see more patients? It, it might be a rougher measure. Then comes the question of how should we measure? A very common way that you'll see in a lot of reports is, is just tables of data. And um, these, these aren't very, very effective. Um, not, not very useful for using as data for improvement. You, any, any of you who have significant management responsibilities will, will often see rafts of slides and reports with just numbers um, put in front of you. And you, you can't see what's happening at a glance. Often um, data is aggregated to, to levels where it's, it's kind of meaningless. Uh, often things are looked at on a quarterly or monthly basis and you, you often don't get enough granular detail to tell what's, what's really been happening, where, where the problems actually lie. Um, another very common common way of, of showing data is pie charts. This is the same, same table shown as a pie. And um, I, I'm sad to see so many pie charts in the NHS. They, they very rarely offer any value. Um, they're, they're just nice and colorful, um, but often they, they, the naked eye can't really tell which sections are significantly bigger. And generally line charts by bar charts or even tables of data are better. So most of I'm putting this up here is just, just don't use them unless uh, there's a really good reason. Um, bar charts, a bit, a bit better. I mean, you, you can see at a glance um, which, which quarters are better and uh, a little bit of movement between them. But what I'm kind of showing here is that there isn't enough granularity. A quarterly basis isn't enough to see if, if improvements or anything significant are really happening here. Usually you're, you're gonna need more regular data capture to make um, responsive and regular continuous improvement. Thinking about things on a, on a weekly or even daily basis, sometimes even hourly basis is the better way for tracking 
tracking performance. The last one I'll show is, again, this, this often comes up in quality assurance and in a lot of management documents, which is the use of RAG rating, red, amber, green statuses. Um, again, they're, they're a slight improvement, but mostly, mostly this is about judgment and target hitting. They're, they're not very effective for actually driving improvement. Quality improvement really is about using data to, to try and help us improve things. It's not about holding people to account and for judgment. We, we have performance management and quality assurance processes built into um, to every element of the hospital to do those things. Um, with quality improvement, it's far more about trying to be objective, understand what's going on and um, address the, the root causes and problems. So, this is what I would suggest a good chart for quality improvement is. Now, this uh, at a glance might seem a little bit imposing to some of you. Um, this is an SPC chart, a statistical process control chart. Um, there's a lot going on there at a glance uh, where, where I'm saying that, you know, we, we really want to be able to see very easily what, what's happening in a, in a system. Um, maybe this, this doesn't immediately seem to fit that bill, but SBC charts really are the, the gold standard for driving continuous improvement. Also known as Schuhart charts, um, and they were invented at Bell Labs back in the 1920s. Um, some of you may well know about the work that Bell Labs did. Um, they and Toyota are probably the two most quoted in terms of the, the key developers of quality improvement methodologies. And um, this was one of their major, major innovations, the SPC chart, which was used to monitor complex systems and help, help improvers really understand what was happening in those systems and to prevent them from over or under reacting to, to changes. Um, used very extensively in manufacturing. Creating an SPC chart actually isn't very difficult. Um, you, uh, you first plot your points on a regular line chart, um, dates scaled along the x-axis and whatever you're measuring along the y-axis. You ideally want to have at least 21 data points as a baseline. Um, if you don't have that, which we don't always, you have to just use what you've got. As long as your data isn't sort of wildly all over the place, um, half a dozen or a dozen data points can be enough. You, you just have to accept that um, your, your first bit of collection going on from there is, is not gonna be uh, quite as robust um, but the further on that you collect data, the, the more robust this will become for you. Um, ideally, you, you, plot, uh, you plot your data points at uh, reasonable regular uh, frequencies. Uh, this one's done monthly, but as, as I said before, you, you might be more appropriate doing weekly, daily, or, or even less. Once you've got your baseline, your baseline data, you take a mean of it, dividing a sum of the data of those 21 points over, over the number that you've gathered. And you set control limits, which are set at three standard deviations above and beyond that mean. You now have a chart that's ready for analysis. Now, there's software out there that you can Google, which will allow you to create the chart very easily. If you're lucky enough to have a QI team or a, a business information team with a bit of capacity, it's very likely that if you ask them nicely, they will happily set one up for you. But otherwise, this, this is all easily doable on Excel. Um, once you've got a chart going, there's a lot that you can do with it. Um, 
first thing that you'll spot is any any points that are outside of your control limits are, are definitely worth investigating. These, these are what we would call special case variations. Any movement in between your control limits would be considered normal variation. Uh, and there's a lot of variation in, in hospital processes. So it's, it's not necessarily alarming to see things going up and down from week to week. We see different caseloads. We um, see big shifts in, in how things uh, are performing based on school holidays, national holidays, weather, um, big events happening in, in the local area can, can drive traffic. Um, if, if your whole team has a particular conference that they, they all pile out to for one week of the year, you can, you can see strange spikes in, in performance. Um, and a lot of that will, will just be natural, normal variation that you shouldn't overreact to. But for points coming over or under three standard deviations away from your mean, it's definitely worth looking into those, those events. Those are potentially things that, that need to be addressed or will have risks for, for the future. And uh, certainly things that 99% you know, of your data should not fall outside of those control limits. So these are particularly important events. You can also um, clearly look for runs. These might be seven or more points um, above or below the mean. Um, sometimes you might have one or two points that, that drop, drop the other side. So you could also look for 10 out of 11 going above or below the mean, 12 out of 14, 14 out of 17, you know, those, those sort of ratios of points. And uh, where, where you start to see these long runs, that's actually statistically significant. That shows you that whatever you're doing in your system is, is having a sustained um, effect and is actually affecting your, your natural variation at that point. Um, it would be appropriate if, if those runs persist, if you're getting up to sort of 14, 15 points, you would take a new baseline at that point and you would adjust your mean up or down to whatever that new level of performance was. So three cool things about SPC, they measure processes over time, allowing you to see um, what impacts any changes you make have. They uh, allow us to understand the natural variation in a process, um, allowing us to see if what we're doing uh, is, is affecting that natural variation and preventing us from overreacting to changes in performance that might be normal. And they do allow us to identify those significant events or um, sustained uh, long-term changes in performance. Okay, now coming on to the third element of the model for improvement, which is, is about ideas. Um, so there are many, there are many different ways that we could potentially change things in our systems to improve quality. Um, again, we, we often latch onto solutions that maybe we think that we can get through quickly or that um, are achievable based on our skill sets mm -hmm. or lack of challenges that we're facing. Um, QI suggests that we should try and take a step back, um, should try and get away from the noise of day-to-day -day running. And uh, so I think I have an issue with my sound. Unfortunately, okay. QI, QI suggests that we should try and step back and we should do a little bit of assessment of the, the variety of different ideas that uh, could make an improvement. And we shouldn't just locate, fixate on one solution. The best way is to test a wide variety, uh, use data to quickly uh, observe the impact of those changes 
and um, iterate and adapt and refine those improvements till they're as good as they can be. Um, a number of different ways that we can generate ideas for change. Uh, we can steal from other industries. We can challenge the existing sort of way that things have always been done and, and you know, really kind of break down processes to see if they're still fit for purpose. Things like process mapping and uh, use of tools such as driver diagrams can be very good for uh, drilling into how we do things at the moment and brainstorming new ways of doing things. Engaging with our colleagues and uh, seeing what, what, what they believe could be the way forward. Um, getting a, a wide variety of different viewpoints is potentially, you know, when, when you're starting out, there, there, there is no such thing as a bad idea. Um, and certainly hearing everybody out will potentially mean that they engage more with the project and don't become a blocker for it further on down the line. When trying, when looking at the various ideas that you've got and trying to find ones which are, are likely to succeed, there are five traits which have been identified that really help facilitate adoption. Those are its relative advantage to what you're currently doing, uh, simplicity, understandability of it, that it can be trialed before full adoption, um, its compatibility with uh, current systems, processes, and that it can be observed by other people. Um, you know, being able to see how another team is working before you adopt it yourself and seeing the results it has often helps. As mentioned briefly before, driver diagrams are a great way also of identifying areas that you could potentially work on. Um, this is about taking your overall goal, looking at all the major factors that um, affect its performance, and then considering all the things that you could uh, adjust within those activities that might, might make a difference. For example, if your aim was to decrease your fuel costs this year, you might think I can uh, buy cheaper, cheaper petrol, I could drive less, or I could increase my efficiency, um, quickly see, potentially have secondary and tertiary levels of drivers behind this. And increasing efficiency might be improving your own driving or it might be increasing your car efficiency. Once you break down a task into all the things that affect it, you can very quickly start generating ideas for how you would influence each of those that might then carry on through and affect your overall aim. So once you've got ideas that you're, you're ready to test, the model for improvement suggests that a plan, do, study, act cycle is an effective way of testing, uh, adapting and adopting ideas that work. Um, this is a it's an adaption of the scientific method uh, about generating a, a hypothesis, your plan for experimenting, undertaking your, your experiments under controlled conditions, studying the results of it, and then adapting your, your next iteration of um, experiments based on the results of this. Often asking yourself, like, do, do we, was this successful? Do we adopt it? Could it be better? Do we adapt it? Or uh, is this a failure? Do we, do we learn lessons from it, but reject this plan and focus our energies elsewhere? Quite often the traditional approach is that, you know, some people might meet in a meeting room, they come up with a plan and they, they tell people to go and implement it. Um, often some challenges with this, you know, often not everyone in the, the meeting room agrees, but they've, they've just got to come up with a plan. So there's not always huge amounts of buy-in or, or belief that it's going to work. And sometimes a lack of belief is enough to make something fail on, on its own. Um, with a set solution chosen from the beginning, there's no testing of alternatives. And uh, quite often, the, even if something is successful, it won't have been iterated or improved to the level that it will achieve the best possible results that it could do.
a PDSA approach, you go in with an aim and initial plan, but the plan is to try things, it's to experiment and adapt, and then bring back the results and only fully adopt, scale up and spread the, the elements that really work, that are now evidence-based, have, have been shown to be effective, and uh, those are the ones that we will then implement and try and make long-term practice. With the traditional approach, the planning stage is often quite short, but actually trying to make that work in the real time and clumsy sort of working it out takes, takes a lot of doing, mm -hmm. if it ever actually achieves the result at all. PDSA approach, there's definitely more planning and discussion and brainstorming at the beginning. You, you do have to commit to coming back and reviewing and documenting a lot of these things, but time and time again, it's been shown to, to save time in, in the overall. It's another way of looking at that the same way. One huge advantage of the PSA cycle is that you, you can do very rapid and very small scale tests. Um, you know, you, you might try out a hypothesis with one patient in a clinic, um, consider how that went, adapt it for the next patient. You, you could potentially do 15 PDSAs in a morning and have 15 bits of data. And you know, your, your, your learning from each might be, um, okay, I need to do this a few more times and see if it's reproducible or that I can't really use this data point because there were some other events happening during my experiment that it was, it was never gonna succeed. But you can iterate very quickly um, things that work, you can scale up and you can see, does this only work in, in one area or would it work across a whole division, a whole trust, a whole CCG? Um, allows you to do things at very low risk and have the evidence um, you need to justify the next level of risk and get more buy-in across bigger areas. When doing PDSAs, um, it's usually good to only test one change at a time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if, if you're changing two things, one could be successful and one could have a negative impact and it could look like there was no improvement or you know, even if you have a successful one, was it from both or did you only need to make one change to achieve it? But that doesn't mean you can't be running multiple PDSAs at the same time and testing different ideas simultaneously, um, then bringing them together, uh, you know, all of the successful things to see if when done uh, alongside each other, do they still have the same positive benefits? Okay, so that covers the model for improvement um, and PDSAs. I had a few more slides, but I'm, I'm aware I'm running out of time and uh, I should open up for, for questions. In the meantime, I had a couple of questions for you. And considering the, your recent experience working with AI and QI, uh, do you have any thoughts on how going forward we could incorporate AI into designing QI projects? Um, yes, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of applications for, for artificial intelligence and QI. Um, Again, for, for producing more data um, to help us understand how interactions in complex systems affect each other. Having, having digital tools that are regularly looking across, how do I, how do I phrase this? There, there, are just, there are vast amounts of data produced in hospitals. Um, we have dozens of different clinical systems and software packages constantly um, producing reports that don't speak to each other. And some of the tools that we're seeing coming out at the moment are finding patterns and trends and interactions across different data sets that you know, PhD students would have spent years um, uncovering if they'd looked at them manually. Uh, what we do with, with this data and the findings I don't think that's really being very well harnessed in, in most hospitals, um, certainly not this year uh, anyway, but 
the, the prospects are very exciting. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I've answered the question very well. That is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of exciting yeah, work. I mean, to be fair, I think, I think AI overall is, AI in healthcare has been a, a very, very slow uh, adapt, adaptation and imbibing process, uh, considering the, the amount of thought behind keeping uh, patient confidentiality and data confident, confidentiality intact. But yeah, you're right. Uh, the other question I had was a more practical uh, question. So a, a lot of us are interested in quality improvement, uh, but let's say most of us would be in a busy clinical job where we can't put that much time into purely quality improvement. And a lot of us won't have the benefit of amazing QI teams to help us out. So would you have any easy tips for people working in day-to-day -day clinical scenarios or clinics, which would sort of put, put one in the mindset for quality improvement and uh, setting up a quality improvement project or thinking how and where we can improve in our day-to-day -day clinical life? Okay. Um, one of the first things I'd say is even if you do not have a QI team um, at your hospital, it's definitely worth exploring what resources you do have and what support you can get. Um, and definitely like early on in, in, in your sort of project life cycles as well, whether it's seeking out your patient information lead or your clinical audit leads, um, your sort of responsible manager for clinical outcomes, governance, um, business information, business intelligence teams as well. They, they can offer you huge amounts of support and take a lot of the hard technical work off of you, whether it's, it's drafting documents for you or creating surveys, which are, are written in a perfect way to avoid bias. Um, business information and business, business intelligence, those guys can set up dashboards and monitoring for you so that you don't have to do manual data collection. Um, can save you huge amounts of time. Again, this, this is probably not a year when uh, they'll be taking many, many requests, but actually in, in previous years, they, they loved doing this work at most of the hospitals I, I was at. It allowed them to um, use their, their data skills to um, address patient problems much more closely than just doing a monthly report on waiting times and uh, outcomes. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is, you know, time, time is limited. Um, I completely understand that, but having some understanding and mindfulness of uh, improvement methodologies and techniques you, you can apply these things at a small scale every day in, in, in your work. Um, as I say, I mean, considering between each patient, you, you can do an experiment with your next patient. Like if, if I greet them in a different way, what sort of reaction do I get? If, if I use a certain style of body language or uh, tone of voice, do they respond differently to me? But doing constant experiments of change, um, reflecting on the results and adapting your practice regularly, not just following a, a sort of tried and tested approach. You, you can be improving um, every single day. Finding the time to then share that, that knowledge and spread it to other people and, and help them build capability as well is, is, is the challenge though. Um, you do need to usually to carve out proper time to do QI on a, on a bigger scale and be able to embed and, and sustain it. But you can quality improve your own practice, certainly, if you don't have very much time for it.